So um, we're a, a team, a group of four people specialized in these kind of things, how to rob a bank. So how do you do that? Well, let's make some rules of engagement today. We will do this together. Maybe some ideas from you, some ideas from me. We do this together, no guns allowed. So we'll make scenarios, we'll make ideas. Let's keep the physical world out there. Let's do it, cyber. This is the, the hip buzzword, let's use that. Let's do full digital attacks on banks. And in my work, I give, the, I give back the money afterwards. I do this for banks, for big multinationals, as a training. We train them for two things. One, senior management. What is the impact? What would really be happening? How would, would it be? Did they really believe that digital bank robbery is, well, bank robbery may be, for banks it may be different, but for like multinationals in this industry, they believe no one will steal our intellectual property. Well, guys, it's already happening. The Chinese are running there. Uh, other countries are stealing that. So just to make that impact. And on the other hand, there are companies that build security monitoring, that have extensive investments in SOC security operations. But how do you know if it works? And does that really work in case there's a real incident? In case you don't know when the attacker comes back and he always comes back at 12 o'clock at night or three o'clock at night when the best analysts are asleep. And maybe even the, the attacker is looking into the agenda of the analyst of what they're thinking. So we're trying to get the analysts and the SOC, the SOC team to get their training as part of a as part of a big exercise. They are not aware of that we're trying that this is an exercise. They really believe that they're, they're hunting down an incident. They really believe they're being robbed. That's kind of our my daily job. Yes, that is fun. <laughs> so how do you do that? So robbing a bank. Where shall we start? Anybody IDs, previous experience? <laughs> Social engineering? Yeah. Yes? Because you said no cyber, uh, only cyber, but... Yes, social engineering, we can, we can do this cyber social engineering, we can do it digital, yes. I, uh, I typically don't walk into an office, because there's a camera, they're recording me, I don't want to be there. <laughs> there's an idea. I recently acquired a uh, quite interesting flash application. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That I may send in an email or something. Yes, sending an email, maybe combine that with the social engineering. Take the cash machine. Hmm? Take the cash machine, like the, the cash vending machine. Yeah, directly to the cash machine, directly for the money. That's, that's, that's yeah, not, not directly like punching it, but like the, the, the other, like the, the bank or the, the money part and the computer part. Yeah, and then in between there are two cables, you put in a USB cable and then a keyboard and then you talk <laughs> and this binary and then the ledger goes open. Yes, it's, it's a trick, but it's... You don't. You won't get big money out of it. Yes, it's it's good money, but it's not the big vault. It's only one teller. Let's do the real big things. <laughs> uh, do some recon. Just checking out this, uh, on LinkedIn. Yes. Who their people are. How the systems work. Good ideas. So let's let's combine these three ideas. So what we'll do is we'll follow what we call the APT kill chain. This is a model uh, coined by Lockheed Martin after the Aurora attacks somewhere. Uh, in 29 or 28, when, when was it? 2008 it was. Um, Lockheed Martin and uh, Google, Microsoft all got compromised by a group of actors and they said, well, how did they in the end work? And they made a model out of it and said, well, they started with recon, selecting the targets, weaponization, developing these attack methods. So but use the knowledge, build the cyber weapon, deliver it. That's where phishing and the email comes into play. Gain access, install your malware, establish command and control. So yes, you have malware running, but you're on the other end of the world. So how do you make sure that you're connected? But also make sure that you're anonymous. That's of course important. If you're doing this as a, as a real heist, you do want to do this anonymous. And as we're trying to do a real heist, we want it to be anonymous as well. So we set up this command and control, so we make sure that we can communicate with our own malware, our own viruses. And in the end, once we're in, we did all the preparation, then we start thinking about, hey, wait a minute, we had some crown jewels, where is exactly trading happening, where is exactly the big faults, let's then move into these targets. So not too fast to the, uh, to the tellers, let's first get into the network. 
So, recon. So let's let's just do some recon, right? Let's start. So I've uh, I've prepped a couple of things. So this is Hunter.io. They're uh, a recon tool. What they do is they collect email addresses of companies, and they get uh, email addresses, phone numbers, roles, descriptions, etc. So let's just take a, a Dutch multinational bank. I hope. So let's take all email addresses ending on ing.com. Probably find quite a bit. So these are the people there. Um, they have uh, verified check marks that these email addresses are working right now. They have this is an investor. This is a press officer uh, having a phone number there. Well, this is quite nice and useful information for me for, for reconnaissance. I can start building an idea about who works there, what role he has. But similar, we can do this. We can do this via LinkedIn. So this is someone, I won't disclose the name hopefully. He works uh, via, talk, via an interim company for the dealer desk at Rabobank. And he, they use SCCM software. Oh, they use a Windows installation, nice. Uh, they administrate the desk via Leo Steam Broker, ah, nice. Uh, all systems have six works, six screens per desk. Uh, they use blades. Zero SLA, they just are sitting next to the, to the trading room officers. Well, that's nice reconnaissance, nice information. Maybe this is someone we want to talk, talk to and send emails about. We now have a storyline, we have information. We can tell him, look, there's a new update for this software because we know he's using this software. Other things we can do, unfortunately I can't demo it live because my Bitcoin transfer didn't pass through in time, but this is uh, leakbase.pw, they collect uh, password dumps which are out there, so once Adobe got compromised, once the Yahoo leak was out there, all there are all kinds of leaked databases in the world, they collect them for you, and you can just, uh, I think, pay a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, Bitcoin cents, and then you get, a, get access. And in this case, I search, uh, I search for, I'm not sure which bank I searched for, but you're already at 5,000 hits. But I have to have the paid version to show the original email addresses and the original um, cracked passwords. And yes, these passwords may not be valid for that person, but I do have an email address. I do have a storyline. I know which social media service they're using. Uh, I know information. So I'm, this is starting my reconnaissance. But this is all a bit underground. We can also just check the vacancy side. They're looking for an, they're looking for a graduate student. Well, I, I, I believe there are quite some students in here. Email addresses uh, on the bottom of the mail of the recruiter and a photo. So I have a lot of information for reconnaissance already in this uh, <coughs> on, on, the, on, the, on the more corporate website as well. And in this process. So in the, from, from, from recon to, to building our storyline, let's meet Mark. Mark is a student in business. Mark doesn't really exist. We made up Mark two years ago. He has a LinkedIn profile. He chats things. I believe he has for his Facebook. He, he is quite believable. This is his website. And we use him, and we have a couple of more of these fake identities to... To, to send these emails out and to have to have stories to to, uh, to to our victims. So he has a website. He's an ambitious student, soon to be uh, graduating, and he's now doing his uh, graduate. Stu uh, he's looking for an intern job. Uh, hard worker, no nine to five mentality. Everything he wants here as a recruiter. <laughs> so we want to build a weapon. But we're attacking banks. They have. Good tools. They have antivirus. They have sandboxing technology, which will monitor if we start sending emails out. So, at these sandboxes, what they do, any email which comes in, and it's an executable file, it will start executing it and analyze how it executes and see if it starts communicating back and forth because then it's a virus. Or see if it's just a, a word file or just a passive file and it will leave it at rest. Quite advanced technology. Way around, very simple. 
we just sent an email saying, hi recruiter, I'm here by recruiting for a HR internship. Um, I encrypted this file with the password because, well, it, this is personal information. So I encrypted it with the password, which is my name Van Buren because I'm Mark Van Buren. Uh, so here it is. And suddenly 10,000 or 100,000 euros of investments in sandboxing technology went down the drain with adding a password on a file. And this is what the recruiter in the end gets. So this is just an example of what we then we then do. We try to make a convincing story of the user why he should enable these security warnings. And there are multiple storylines you can think of. So this is saying this was created with a wrong version of, of Office, and this is actually quite a cheesy one. We're doing we're sending out look we're building an, an, a, a survey so we have a survey studio so you see a screenshot please enable content to uh, to, to run this survey and yes people will say oh it's a survey I need to click on click enable and they will run enable and normally that would be protected mode but because it was in a zip and you encrypted you unzipped it from the zip it's no longer in protected mode if you're lucky so that's the other other, other advantage of, of this system so. Sometimes we misfire, things we send out, we send out something and it doesn't really work because we don't know our victim that well. Then we get these emails nicely, I mean, we're sending this out to people that are service oriented. We're sending this out to someone who is in HR, <coughs> they want to get someone in. We're sending out these emails to someone in PR, they want to communicate. We don't send this, these kind of emails to IT guys. IT guys say, well, let, let me do my job, but these guys want to help, they're, they're service oriented. So yes. We've had people that we had seven interactions with sending one email. Does it work? And we got we, we see on our end being blocked, and we said, see the other end saying, well, it didn't work. Here's a screenshot. Can you share, please send me the survey again? And so we are having these back and forth user friendly customer service experience, which is nice for us as an attacker. Uh, but yeah, that that's that's how we work, and that's how a real attacker would work as well. So. What happens if you, let me, yes, uh, VMs, VMs. So, what happens if the user would click this enable, enable content button? Well, actually, for the user, nothing would happen in this case. So, the button went away. And this is just a demo version. So, in typical scenarios, we just silly hide word. So the user can't click, so you can't close Word anymore. But within the, the Word process, there's now malicious code running, which we created inside that macro. And the malicious code connects back to us. Um, right. So let's first do this one. So what we see here is what we call our command and control infrastructure. We have three layers. This is the victim network. This is the bank. This is a layer of anonymization. And this is us. And what we've just been doing is sending an email out via this via an anonymization layer into the network, being executed because the user clicked, uh, clicked allow content. And then our malware starts com communicating via HTTP or HTTPS to one of these anonymization layers. And what they are, are for us, they're boxes in Amazon, in Digital Oceans, or in Trans IP, wherever we hire them. And for a real attacker, they're also they hire them, or they just use hacked web servers or hacked servers. And what it makes sure is that if, if you're running an investigation on this end, you only see traces which are not a real not the real attacker. They are, you only see traces of anonymization layers, and in the real life world, there will be multiple layers of this in multiple legal position, uh, legal jurisdictions. So even uh, police investigation is in vain because it's from Russia to the US, back to Ukraine, and then suddenly everything conflicts and doesn't work together anymore. So this machine asks every ten, uh, every minute to the. Uh, anonymization layer, which just takes the message and forwards it to us and asks, what do I need to do? That's everything that happens. Every every minute it asks, what should I do? This is the command and control channel we just set up. It was one click of one user. So you have invested 
a lot of money on your fancy boxes, invested quite a bit on your antivirus, and one click, one user. It's, but of course, we've, we've, we have a risk. The user can reboot, the user can log out. So if the user, so at this point in time, we're running within the word process. We're now, we are now the word process. If someone closes Word, we have a problem. We can do very technical tricks, getting high privileges on the machine, building a new service on it, and getting that to, to run every time the system boots up. We can also do very simple tricks where, well, they also work. So if you take a standard office worker, he starts his day by either starting Word or by starting Outlook. That's typically what's, what's being run all day long, every day. So you can build persistency within Word, like build a macro which always starts up if Word starts up, but you can also just take the shortcut button to Outlook and replace that by a script which first starts up your virus and then starts Outlook. Well, no one will notice if as long as the icon is okay and the software starts, everybody is happy. So a lot of ways and, and tricks to hide your traces there. And then we're on a machine, on one machine, um, and we want to get higher privileges. We want to get the credentials of the user, for example. And one of the typical tricks employed nowadays is what we call abusing the WDigest protocol. WDigest was a single sign-on protocol designed by Microsoft. It's being deprecated as of Windows 8. It's no longer enabled by default. Um, so it works as follows. Server sets an ANS, and the client sets back the MD5, the username, password, nonce, get, and the URL. From a network attack perspective, if you're a network sniffer, it's quite an okay protocol. But if you're on this client, there's suddenly something strange happening because the only way how you can calculate this MD5 is if you somewhere in memory have this password. So instead of all other protocols work by tickets and by smart IDs have not having passwords in memory, but this protocol relies on passwords in memory. So if we can access the memory, well, then we can, uh, we can get the password of the user. It's a nice trick. There are much easier tricks here. So just keep calm, we just ask. So I just demoed how this uh, this beacon came in, how this beacon was started up on the, on the computer end. This is our backend. This is the monitoring we as an attacker have. This is a toolkit called Cobalt Strike. Um, if you look here, uh, let's see if I can zoom this in a bit. I'm not sure if I can zoom this in. So now, What I'm now doing is, so every, what we see here on the top is we see a list of all the, the machines connecting. So we see this testing virtual machine for me. It's connecting via this redirection machine. Uh, we're running in this process ID um, and we can put some notes in it. And it connects every, it connected every minute, the initial time I started it up. But now I said, well, let's make it interaction. So every, Every millisecond is now pulling. So this is causing a lot of network traffic. If you're doing this in a, in a, in a, normal, uh, in a normal corporate network. So you want to avoid this, but for a demo, we can do this. Um, but we can now send any command to this machine. So if we can, if we say uh, shell dir c. So this is the C drive of my Windows machine. Communicated via this channel, via this anonymization layer. And I can send any command. I can also send PowerShell commands, and I got a nice one. So, I gave a PowerShell command to show a prop-up on the user's desktop. So yes, I can do a lot of technology to get the user, to get the machine to give me the password, or I can just start showing annoying pop-ups, doing phishing on the desktop. Well, who won't fall for this? Everybody will type in his password. 
And what we'll do, is even, so if I type in a password here, let's, let's do a welcome. So here we see it, the output coming back. And the nice thing is, if we do this and the user starts typing in his password, and you give the, uh, the pop-up again, he believes, oh, I pro probably needed the other password. So if you do this five times, you'll start seeing his normal password behavior. You'll start learning about how he thinks. You'll get his home password as well. Just, you're, you're learning really about how he thinks. So that's, that's a nice, nice trick. And it's, yeah, local phishing kind of. So again, yes, a lot of technology. Just keep it simple. So we're in a network. Um, just one user, secretary, HR employee, and we want to move further. We want to move closer to our crown jewel systems. And then we get into the world of Active Directory and, and how the Windows Active Directory works. So the Active Directory is a collection of all the machines. And there's metadata in it, so there's a description of every server and every user in the network. That's nice. I really like it if you put name your systems and you put the description e-payment system. This system is hosting the vault. Ooh, that's what well, didn't be, be in there. Surprise, surprise, let's look there. So we can kind of make our ideas about where our targets are. So by using this one computer, we start probing around the network. We won't run aggressive network scans. We just ask systems. We just ask metadata of systems. We will just learn and see where the most likely one vulnerability is, or maybe not even a real vulnerability, but more a misconfiguration, where we by default know a, 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 an account being all, always having a, a weak password and seeing that the password has not been reset for 10 years. We can guess that that service account is probably the same as what was in the manual or what was uh, in a leak 10 years ago. And if we, if we, if we get into one server, we can ask the Active Directory, look, where are then the, vi the VIPs logged in? Or where are maybe not the VIPs, where are maybe the domain administrators logged in? Because they have the highest power in the network. And then we use them to, to make a kind of a path towards the administrative workstation and from that towards the crown jewels. So we're kind of connecting the dots. So you have 10,000 servers in there, and there are probably a couple of paths between me, a normal user, somewhere in HR, and the domain administrator, and maybe the person in the vault. So I'm not doing this myself. No, we're using graph theory. Let's go back to our uh, education. Let's go back <coughs> to Dijkstra. Let's do shortest path algorithms on the network. So this is a visualization of an Active Directory where these <coughs> This person is an app into that machine, and he's logged in on that machine. So we can make a, we make a, we can just apply graph theory, and in the end we can draw a, a shortest path, which tells us, look, you have this permission. With this permission, you're allowed to log in on that machine. If you run up, the following other users are logged in on that box. If you would run a password number there, you will get these credentials. That credential you can connect to that machine, and by that we can make a nice, a nice graph. And this is not something per se wrong in in, in Active Directory. Um, we can do similar things in Amazon. So these are Amazon security groups of one of these, uh, like Facebook, huge uh, Amazon Park uh, companies. And they have all kinds of security groups. And you can make similar yeah, theories about how permissions work and make graphs out of it, and suddenly as an attacker, you're getting completely different viewpoints than how they were originally designed. Because there, yes, there is some path from acceptance to production, just no one knows it. Uh, and this is, of, of course, exactly the path that we're looking for. And these tools are still a bit immature, but this is where we see the world of hacking big corporates uh, really move into, into yeah, bringing graphs and visual theory into play to make this an understandable world. So, by doing this graph theory and doing a couple of iterations over this, and maybe doing some phishing on the workstation and hacking one or two computers, it really is not per se much more technology than that. Uh, 
And yes, banks are preparing themselves and are getting better in this game. So over time, we will all grow. But this is a matter of graph theory until in the end, you'll get into the system where you were interested in, or probably first into a domain administrator. So then on the defense side, it's not always fun to be a defender. I've been that for a couple of years. You're always a couple of steps behind. You get informed once an incident is running for three months or for a month. You don't know when it started. But there are some tricks where we are growing. So one of them is seem. Just collect a lot of logs and make smart correlation rules. As I just told, my command and control is now running every milliseconds, sending communication back and forth. So one computer is sending a, command, sending, sending a lot of traffic to one IP address or maybe one domain name, just register it. Uh, so maybe you should want, want to have an alert on that and have that investigated. And maybe correlate that with the fact that on that computer, uh, the user got an email from someone who we never emailed before, who was not in the, in, the, in the internal network. So you need a lot of logs, a lot of privacy invasion to make these kind of ideal rules, because that's kind of what you want. So we're sending an email out of the blue, getting command and control out of it. Well, that's something I, as an analyst, would like to know. So seems, well, think about processing about a terabyte of data a day, and then you're in a team of 10 guys, so you want 10 alerts, maybe 20. You can't handle much more than that. So this is filtering smart. And then there are people asking, yeah, but we got this report from this threat intelligence vendor about this incident half a year ago, where we infected. So that means a terabyte a day, searching it back for a year. Yes, it takes some brain power. It doesn't take that much computation. It takes a lot of computation power, but doing it smarter can really save your day there. Especially if you're running in an incident, you want to make sure that you're on the same learning pace as the attacker. So the attacker is making his graph in your network. As an attacker, you want to make the same graph about what, what he's intending to do and what he's doing. So the other bullet here, endpoint detection response. Um, so what do we do if such a seam? Yes, the seam is, is, nice, is a nice tool. It gives me alerts. But what happens if we, if we have an alert? We don't know where the attacker was in his stage. Maybe he already got the money. Maybe he's just in the initial reconnaissance phase. Maybe he got 10 workstations and I'm now unplugging one. So I want to learn as an, as an analyst as well. And for that, I need tools. Um, and yes, I can learn a lot from the sims, from the sim, but they're typically network oriented. So they collect everything passing through our corporate proxy. They collect everything from the net flow on the network, or they collect everything um, from the antivirus engines. But I want to go very deep into one, like in one system. What happened in this system at that point in time? And that's where these endpoint detection and response tools come into play. Let me see whether I can find the right VM. So what this is, this is a demo of a tool called Redline. Uh, it's a free product, not open source, from Mandiant, uh, FireEye, which is a kind of an NSA daughter, but unofficial. Um, and this tool, it can collect, let me see if I can uh, get it. Uh, no, Magnif magnification tool. Ah, this doesn't really work, I guess. <laughs> I'll, I'll just talk you through it. So what it does, it just collects a lot of data on the system and a lot of historical data, a lot of forensic data. So here is a tab file system. It collects when does a file create it, when is a file edited last time, etc. The same for the registry, Windows services, typical persistency locations. So what are the startup directories used on the system? Which services typically run? Um, what users are edited? the Windows uh, logs, et cetera, et cetera, DNS uh, traffic, all kinds of details. As an analyst, um, yes, that uh, I, I can dive into what exactly happened, but I, the only thing I have is I've seen on the network this system beaconing 
it's yeah, so it started communicating back and forth from well, what, what was it 820 today and that's the only thing i know there's a system in out there it starts communicating with a strange ip address and it started five minutes ago so how do i start with a lot of data on the file system how do i connect that together well the only thing i can do is actually i can make a timeline so in the world of the forensics, in the world of the uh, uh, of, of the incident investigators, we're doing a lot with the timeline. And in this timeline, again, sorry for the readability. All the events, so from the file system, from the log files, they're all put together in one chronological order. And now I can start filtering, saying, look, give me what started this on this machine six minutes ago, because this is five minutes plus the one minute, hopefully I'll see some evidence of this email being dropped on and, and the, the word file being dropped on disk. And give me everything until now. And then I can dive very deep into this and start learning about what the attacker knows. So what is he actually doing? Was this just commodity malware, which by accident passed through our antivirus? Or is this someone very sophisticated, knowing about where to place his persistency mechanism, very tailored, uh, connecting into our network, uh, very, very, very much hidden? So this is a uh, this is just a step in your incident response cycle. So you're running these kind of investigations, and you can imagine, as an analyst, this takes time. So as an attacker, you're typing one ping command. I see a network connection, and as an analyst, I will run an investigation if you're in bad luck. It takes me two hours. One ping command, I'm uh, so the attacker is always kind of in an information position advantage. He knows what he wants to do, and I just am running behind him trying to find it. Um, yeah, so, so this is uh, how, in the end, we find the one MD5 of the attacker. So by building this timeline, we find, okay, it was this file being dropped, it was this email, it was that subject, and that's email uh, that that mail uh, that mark van buren entity being abused and based on that we can then go back to our sim this huge log file and say well did someone else get an email from mark van buren did someone else uh, get uh, get similar emails maybe uh, do other do other things and, and cross correlate it together So what we encounter typically is what we say whack a mole. So I've shown you some of these EDR tools and some of these sims. For the first time you're seeing an incident and you see some command and control traffic going to like what you think is a botnet or a malicious uh, thing. The only thing you'll do is block it. That's what a whack a mole. You just punch it on the, on the head and say, well, it's being blocked. Incident closed. Yes. Good for the SLA. We've uh, I've got outsourced uh, SOC, so yes, they scored one for finding it and another one for uh, closing it down within an hour. That's nice. Well, for us, it's we have a couple of these fake identities sending out a similar email. It's a matter of, of, of seconds. In fact, at this point in time, we can spin up new IP addresses on this anonymization layer in 40 seconds. So you can start blocking, you'll be just build new ones in 40 seconds, build a new IP, new domain infrastructure, everything around it. So blocking it is not a strategy to go. And that is one of the things where, why, we, why we say this is a practice, because a lot of companies haven't really thought about these, these later processes. We always think about security incidents, about preventing them, maybe a bit about detecting them, but if you detect them, what do you do? And that is one of the bigger challenges I had of us for, for I believe, for us as security professionals. Um, one of the nice models here is, 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 is this one by uh, David Bianco. He says, well, we can, we can specify and talk about the attacker, and what we call threat intelligence, so the knowledge we have about an attacker. And we can do this on a lot of lo different layers. So there's this layer of hash values where we share MD5 values to each other and we say, you look, I have a million MD5s, how much do you have? And the other vendor comes in and says, well, I have two million. Yes, that's bullshit. We can share IP addresses as an SO, same, same ID, we share lists, uh, domain names, 
And higher in the chain, we get a more thorough understanding of what the attacker is doing, about what he, how he really works. So here we're talking about artifacts. So if I was an attacker and I was using this word uh, attack vector, well, you can say, well, this, this word file he's using, it always leaves this behind on the system. Um, if we go a, a step higher, you can talk about the tools I'm using. He always tries to attack Word, and then he runs Mimikatz as a password dumper. Um, and then, and so you can even talk about the tools me as an attacker having, and then you can talk about how do I think. He always just gets into a network on a, on a HR person. Then he runs a full chain of privilege escalations in the network. And then in the end, he gets to his crown jewels, and then he gets a, a, a bunch of money mules and exfiltrates the money. We can also talk about, so we can talk on different layers of the same attacker. There's a lot of talk on the lower layers. Because they're measurable, we can make nice reports on them. But as an attacker, it's trivial to change. I mean, if you have a hash value of my files, so what? I change one bit and the AV doesn't work anymore. It's not really painful for me. So this is the other axis of this of this pyramid of pain. How hard is it as an attacker? How, how much impact are you making on me? So if you... As a, as a company or working on this, this IP addresses and hash values and blocking me there, yes, you'll get into the easy and annoying world of, yes, I'll, I'll find a way around and uh, I'll, I'll, get into it, I'll get into it next time. I'll just send out more of these annoying emails, different storylines, and in the end, I'll get in there. But if you start thinking about, hey, how are these guys actually thinking? What are they actually doing? And you start thinking on that level and start saying, well, maybe we should, should discuss whether macro should be enabled. And yes, you'll get a business unit saying yes, but our full enterprise calculations for this, <laughs> for this and that are based on, built on macro. You say, okay, let's make some signing on it and approve them, but not the other ones. Um, and then these attack parts, as I, as, as I showed, well, as a, as a defender, we can also use them and we can say, well, let's just detach a couple of them. Let's take this vault and payment systems and put them in like one silo and domain administrators, put them somewhere completely different and then the normal users. And let's, let's make this graph ourselves as, as, as a company and make sure that there are no interconnections between all these kind of files. <coughs> and then we're starting to do interesting work because then we're really, as, 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 a, as defenders, also getting into the mind of, how, what, what technologies and what, what, what IDEs are they behind the attack? <coughs> so the world, the buzzword threat intelligence, which is a buzzword where uh, a lot of, of companies are saying, yes, I, I offer you the, the best one and my product is, is, is fueled by threat intelligence. Yes, but it's mo typically, we're talking about what an antivirus has been doing for years. Eh? Simple things you can easily check, but also simple for an attacker to get, to get around. And what we should be thinking about is how can we change companies to really understand these attackers and not only today, because this is uh, this model where we get in with macros and we move further with privilege escalation and with graph theory and then get into it. That, that will change over time if the defenders get better. But we need to get an understanding about how does this apply to, to companies and how can we really change our full IT landscape if necessary, maybe even preventive before an incident, preferably then afterwards, and then really make it into the number of architectural changes being made based on knowledge of the adversary. So a simple thing would be, <coughs> why are we still running macros? And there are a lot of these kind of, well, simple questions, but companies are doing that for 10 years and banks are typical in that because they, they really are built on macros and they have a lot of, of people in-house which run a small script to calculate this in Excel. Uh, and they're used to that and no one is challenging them until it's too late and then someone in the SOC will say, hey, look guys, the guys came in for our macros. We should have done someone uh, on that 10 years ago. But So this is one of the, cha <laughs> the, the challenges that threat intelligence is a lot of a lot of talking about here where the SOC teams and the defense, the, the, the defense, which we in the end all, all are, we should be thinking about how can we really change IT landscapes and cut through connections, trust lines, uh, and, and really <coughs> disrupt attackers. So that was a sh short introduction, 40 minutes, I guess I made it.
maybe uh, even even uh, I even gave some some insights into how to defend against this. Um, so you have ideas how to to rob the bank yourself now? So it, 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 it depends. So what we typically do is we set up this such an engagement in three teams. So we are the red team. Um, then there's the blue team, which is typically the sock of the uh, of a bank. And then there's a white team. And the white team is doing two things. One, it's giving us an autograph and signing that we are allowed to. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and they, um, together with them, we set rules of engagement. And what they also do is they prevent major shit from happening. So if you don't do anything, yes, police will be informed. Uh, so if you're doing this for a bank, the police will be informed, the National Bank will be informed, a lot of escalations are going to happen. No one is going to out of that. So we have this white team, and in the, in the start of the engagement, we set up rules of engagement. And this is so one of the... The rules of engagement is, are you allowed to actually transfer? The exactly. Money? Or... I could say, yes, you are, but that means... Yes, but typically they say no, or they say, let's sit together. Let's sit together. So okay. you, if you, so if they really believe that the system we're in, if we would manipulate it, it would be detected further in the chain because they have multiple chains. Then we can say, okay, let's go to your office. Sit, just make a reservation booking and don't call it red teaming, but call it Project X. Um, we'll sit together with you, maybe even with an administrator of that system who is then briefed on this very tiny part, saying, okay, we are going to do this. We it's don't want to screw up your database. Something. Well, we're what doing. no, we're, we're asking them, should we do this? And if they say, well, we should find it further out, let's test if it is really detected later on, and let's see how the organization responds then. Well, then we say, okay, but we, we don't know the exact command for this specific application. We also don't want to screw up major databases. I mean, if you change one cent on the one end, you should change it on the other end as well, otherwise the balances don't add up, etc. We're not accountants, <laughs> so let's do this together with someone who at least knows that we're not breaking an application, but just trying to really, well, change one bank number to ours, for example. Yes, but then under supervision. But these are typically the things we discuss in advance, saying, okay, where can't we go? So if they say, well, we're now having a divestment, so we're selling off this part of the company, so we don't want you to go to systems relating to that, because it's one, it is really sensitive, it's uh, insider trading relevant because we're selling this off. Uh, let's just don't go there. We will try to obey to that, but we won't tell the blue team. They are not aware of this, so they still need to investigate the full network, but they just won't see us in Division X because it's being uh, offshore, or maybe it's exactly, uh, specifically of interest because they're buying a new company and saying, look, is this a secure company we just bought? We just acquired it or integrating it in our network. Could you get in via their network into ours? And then you get a very specific scope. So, yeah, in, the, in this in, the, in this in these uh, talks in the beginning of the engagement, we're really this yeah discussing that. Zero. Yes, the preparation. That's more the engagement. Uh, and yeah, what we then do is we we really talk also with the blue team in the end and say, look, these are all the things we did here, and then we ask them bring your timeline, bring your investigation time sheet, and then you'll see the mismatches and say, oh. Wait a minute! You missed you missed this activity of us on that computer. You missed that part. Why? And then we really have a discussion about what we did, why they didn't see it, what log settings you need to be changed, etc. Uh, question: There are lots of uh, big banks and organizations who use mainframes for their uh, primary processes. Do you also try to infiltrate those systems? Typically not. Typically, there's an operator. And typically the operator is a workstation. And that is a much easier way in. Um, my, myself, I have a couple of gray hair, but not sufficient to run mainframe and to have knowledge there. So there are other ways to hack around the process that are easier. So if you have two, two, two uh, four eyes principles, so you get one person to create a transaction, the other one to approve, and it all runs on a mainframe, for us, it's much easier to find two people in the division 
one in the division of create transactions and the other in the division approved transactions. Um, but if 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 there would be an, uh, if it would be necessary, then well, we may <laughs> we may need to get some specialists in, or we we discuss that then with the, with the clients. But especially on the mainframes, even proving access is then probably sufficient. I mean, if you are on the mainframe, you don't need to do anything there. So if you're on the workstation of the mainframe administrator, well, you're close, work, sufficiently close by to prove your points. How do you uh, negotiate the rules of engagement with the client? Because I can understand that a client would say, well, let's keep the attack to this very tiny part that, it's, uh, that is specifically tailored to uh, monitor everything you're doing, but that will not give a, um, a realistic view of how the whole system is actually working. So how do you yeah. negotiate the rules of engagement? Yeah, so, so for that, this is typically not yet, luckily, being enforced by like, um, oversight authorities. So for, at this point in time, most companies do this for themselves. So their incentive is to learn, which makes, makes it a lot easier. At the point that central banks start saying, you must do this, then the incentive for a bank would need be, well, let's scope it to these 10 workstations which are turned off and that one server, which is, okay. so then you really get into that discussion. So, but for now, there's not that much incentive on it. Um, the Dutch central bank is talking about making this more or less mandatory and what they do then do is they say well we have knowledge of threats we have knowledge of threat actors so let's make the scenarios and let's see how they would apply so they say go to the commercial industry maybe our Dutch intelligence services look into it and together they will say yes this is a Russian actor which is most yeah, so one of the scenarios would be a Russian actor getting financial money uh, direct, uh, direct really money, uh, money out. Another scenario maybe relating to, to insider trading, and then, well, the bank doesn't really have a choice because then the scenario already defines a bit which systems at least should be in scope. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the future. About whether this, uh, when this becomes really like mandatory for companies, then this will be a much, much, much more fierce discussion. For now, it's relatively simple. This so far, the uh, at least in the Dutch environment, the rules of engagement allow you to pull out a whole bag of tricks. Yes, but for example, yesterday we asked for a client saying, "Look, we found these three systems. They're all boxes, and in the group of administrators, all the main users are in there. So anybody can log in. We want to explore these systems, uh, run, run password numbers on them, etc." And then the client came back saying, "Yeah, wait a minute. They were already on the decommissioning list for next month." This is not really a good. So you're already seeing that this is there is some cover your ass sometimes involved, and well, we we try to manage that indeed, but it's starting up with clear expectations. Um, and if if it really is scoped down, we will put that down and in, in the end report saying, look, we believe we only saw one percent of ten percent of the network because you you scoped this down from the other ten ninety percent. Well, let's let's put it down on paper then. That's what the end what what they get for they pay for. Questioning some of the details you talked about because this uh, Mark Van Buren, for example, yep. um, what links does he have on LinkedIn? Well, recruiters. Recruiters really like students, ambitious students with uh, business economics background. Um, everybody who's annoying and getting us all re connected, well, we just connect them back via Mark Van Buren. Uh, which well, is a well, nice. Oh yes, would <laughs> it would really make a believable, <laughs> more believable student. So you are not uh, interlinking your, your own fake accounts. No, we're not buying fake accounts. No need for that yet. Uh, in specific scenarios, you may want, but, but typically, then you want to have a link to your victim, where you can make your story via LinkedIn, like via LinkedIn. I yeah, I I got it connected via uh, get connected via someone, but. Buying fake LinkedIn clicks, not really necessary. It's more that if someone Googles you, like, hey, I got an email from a, rec from, from a student with this strange survey, and they Google and say, oh, it's more from, oh, it's really the guy, I see the same picture as a LinkedIn, let's click. That's kind of the check we want to get through. It's not, yeah, it's not, not, not a, a very deep analysis. Uh, okay. yeah. I have another small question. Because the uh, macro you showed didn't do anything to work. 
And he said, in practice, we usually hide the process so that they can't close it. Yes, or we, we, yeah, we hide, we hide Word, we, we, or we remove the file, or we, and it just depends a bit on, on, on the story we're in and the mood we're in. But right. Wouldn't it be practical to just make that button do what they think it's going yeah, to do? Yeah, we also we have one where it really shows a survey, but then we need to think of stories. And so if we remove the, if we, if we delete the screen, and especially in case it malfunctions. So one of the, one of the challenges we sometimes have is Maybe they're running application-wide listening technology. Maybe they're running Windows 10, Windows 7, uh, various versions of uh, Office. Sometimes we're being blocked on the network. We don't know exactly. So maybe the first shot is not right. So if we can convince the user that the, f that the first shot was blamed on him to be wrong. So he says, look, my computer did something strange. Can you send the file again? That really gives us a second shot. If he gets a real survey, he's completed and sent it back. Right. But we've had scenarios where, in the end, we could give the feedback on the lunch survey to the customer, besides our report, saying, look, the croquetta are very nice, but you should really improve on the soups. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, covering the tracks by doing that. Yeah. Right. Final question, uh, I guess, yeah. I see. Oh. Do you own your own banks? <laughs> no. No, we also run uh, in the retail industry, big financials. I mean. What's a bank? A pension fund maybe has more money than a bank. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you're returning the money anyway. Yes, no, but you see that in a couple of industries, a lot of investment has been made on security monitoring, and they are really the ones interesting in this. So uh, more as an exercise, and in the the, the the industries where they didn't really have that that investments, they're sometimes doing this, but then much more lightweight, not so much as a training, but much more to get. An understanding at management level, look guys, we just got robbed, all our intellectual property just got stolen. What what we have done is this would be real, just to make and start this, this internal budget discussion about how important is security. Okay, so let's uh, thank you again.